like a bird from prison walls. Like a bird from prison walls has flown. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, your glory. I'll fly away when I die. One more time. Song number 63. Number 63 in your hymn books. Most of you probably already know the words to this song. I'd like us to sing it together. It's called What a Day That Will Be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore i hear you what a day glorious day together church what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day you believe that this morning church thank you for singing with me you may be seated Lots of humidity, but that's all right, amen. I'm just thankful for the air conditioning in the building, amen. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord for y'all being here today. Thank you for visiting with us today, those visiting. And uh, we have some very special people with us today. And today we're honoring uh, a memorial service for our Deacon Ron Hamner, amen. He's going to be with the Lord, but we want to honor him today as well. And we'll have a time if you have something on your heart the Lord has led you to speak about. Oh, Ron, how he blessed your heart. Please, we have a microphone for that. But uh, glad you're here. Is this one working yet? <laughs> but um, uh, to Bill, Bill Lewis and Linda Lewis, they had birthdays. 
Linda's was on the seventh, and Bill's is on the ninth of Sweetheart's Tomorrow, and their wedding anniversary is on the ninth. So there's a whole lot going on. <laughs> Keep them in your prayers as they travel and minister to the, for the Lord. Dustin Witt's birthday is today, and Rhonda Duff's birthday is today. And let's see, Shirley Blanton has a birthday. Yeah, amen. And Anna anniversary, her and Nick. Amen. I think that's on the 14th. And Ginger has a birthday. Amen. Yeah. Well, these are the ones that I know of right now. And um, Ashley Deal's got a birthday coming up, too. Is that baby now. She's a Clark. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> She's been a clerk for a long time. See, I just knew them since they were children and all that. I still call her Cash. She's the best. <laughs> so God bless you. So we're just happy for you all. And uh, not long do the babies do? Five weeks. Five weeks. Woo! I'll praise her. We're excited. She doesn't show up early. That's right. And just a little boy. Amen. So we're looking forward to that. So God bless you. Keep them in your prayers. We appreciate you. Y'all so much. And um, this time, um, we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. If our deacons would come forward, please. I appreciate that. It's our round robin this morning. A chance to gather for him. Amen. I'm in rebellion this morning. I am not wearing the authorized Dave Cash colors for preaching this morning. Blasphemy. Amen. Blasphemy. Amen, brother. For this morning, I have elected to go with the Jimmy Buffett line of preaching wear. 
Amen. 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 Forgive me, Brother Dave. Forgive me, Brother well, Dave. As long as you wear a New Jersey Vice outfit, it'll be all right. <laughs> you know, I told you a couple weeks, a few weeks ago, the last time I preached, I will never, ever be faster than my wife. And on the way over here this morning, you know, I told her, I said, I get paranoid about my preaching notes. Did I bring them? So I said, would you mind checking in the back? So she did. She said, well, there's something sticking out from your Bible. And then she says, what's annoyed and why do you need a pair of them? Oh, I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> but, you know, questions. Questions and Mary was in a wonderful Sunday school lesson. If you're not coming to Sunday school, you're really missing out. Uh, Mary, Mary's been delivering some uh, wonderful lessons. And she said when she first got saved, she put a lot of questions in her Bible. And this somehow seems appropriate for today, because I was going to preach on this, and the Lord kept forcing me back to it. And then it just kind of flowed yesterday. You know, and questions that we often hear are, why are we here, and what's the point of all this, and why did God do this? Because he certainly doesn't need us. And if God is such a God of love, you've never heard this, then why does he allow all this evil? And if God's so powerful, why didn't he fix all this? And why do people have to suffer? And are there angels and demons? And finally, what it really comes down to with most people that you witness to, does God really exist? And like I say, it seems appropriate for this morning. And I want to help us understand the why of all this. The why of creation, the why that you've been picked out, the why that you're here, the why that he did any and all of this. And I think to begin to understand all this, we need to look at the idea that Jesus is coming back. What's he coming back for? What's he come back for? He's come back for us, his bride, his church, correct? And he desires, Jesus desires to share an intimate relationship with us. And what a glorious day that will be. We're campus though. What a glorious day that will be. Now, scripture doesn't tell us why or how, oh, there you are. Doesn't tell us the why or the how of why he wants a bride. It doesn't seem intuitive. But it does tell us that Jesus is going to rejoice over us as his bride. And the church is, you know, the church, his bride, is made up of those who are saved. Thus, those who are saved are the bride. Now, this is going to get deep, so stay with me. Now, I want you to consider two fundamentals about the bride. Two fundamentals. One of the basics of the bride is that the bride has to be perfectly righteous, meaning the bride must be saved. And we are judged perfectly righteous when? When we're saved. Jesus paid the price for our sins, past, present, and future. So the first fundamental about the bride we have to remember is the bride has to be fundamentally, perfectly righteous. Now, Matthew 10 and Hebrews 3 tell us that those who are faithful to the end are the ones who are saved. In other words, if you're really truly saved, you're going to be faithful, just like Ron was. Okay? Despite all of his own personal sufferings and everything he went to, Ron was faithful to the end. He may have had questions, he may have doubted at time like every single other Christian does, but Ron was faithful to the end. So the second fundamental of the bride is that the bride must prove to be faithful. So the first one gets taken care of when we're saved. But the second one, we're allowed to stay here to prove that we're faithful, just like the passages. Matthew 10, um, Hebrews 3 said. Now, in order to prove to be faithful, what has to happen? 
you have to be given an opportunity to prove that you're faithful, just like Ron was. So you have to have an environment for the bride to be able to be faithful. Am I, are you with me so far? In other words, there has to be an environment that allows for free will and choice. That has to be there. Now let's go back to the fall. What happened with Adam and Eve? What were Adam and Eve presented with? A choice. What were they allowed to do? They were allowed to express free will and choice. God could have stopped. God could have said, serpent, shut up. Go back to your hole, wherever he came from. You two, stop thinking what you're thinking. But he didn't do that. He allowed the process to go on. He didn't intervene. It's part of the plan. If it wasn't part of the plan, he would have stopped it. But it was part of the plan. Now, Genesis 3.4 and Genesis 3.22 tell us Adam and Eve did not know the difference between good and evil. For God knows that when you eat of it, the serpent speaking here, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And actually, the serpent spoke the truth right there. Because of Genesis 3.22, he said, The Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. See, Adam and Eve didn't know what evil was. They didn't know what death was. And how could they? They were in heaven. How could they have known? They were with God at the time. I apologize, I said that wrong. They were with God at time. They weren't in heaven. They were in the garden. Lucifer, the angels, and Adam and Eve were all in God's direct presence, yet they chose to disobey, rebel, and fall. Each one was given one thing. Lucifer says, I want to be above God. The only thing he couldn't be, he was number two in the creation. The one thing he couldn't have. What was the one thing Adam and Eve could not have? The fruit of the tree. So how could they possibly have done this from our point of view? What was going on? See, free will means that we are free to choose. To be able to choose God and deny Satan. But again, free will to be faithful has to have the environment to be able to prove ourselves faithful. We have to be allowed to make choices. So God needed to allow an environment such that a legitimate opportunity to express free will and choose had to be made available. See, God is love. Love does not demand. Love offers you a choice. I did not go to Kathy 33 years ago and say, you will marry me. I asked my wife to marry me. She said, yes, unbelievable. God never forces himself upon us. We get to choose to believe in God and submit to godly authority out of love. Or you can choose to come under the power and the control of the prince of this world. And if you do that, you allow that to happen, a hellish eternity awaits you, tragically. Now, in order to be able to exist outside, to, ex to truly choose to submit to godly authority, what do we have to know? 
you have to know what it's like to exist out of godly authority. See, free will and the seductive power of choice presents an overwhelming urge to know what we don't know, to have what we don't have. And choice is virtually irresistible. Even though you may have, just like Adam and Eve and the angels, there is nothing greater than God. But yet the one thing, they had to find out what it was. They had to find out what it was. Because the woman saw that the fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. She had to know. Just couldn't, just had to know. And God didn't stop them. See, we have to know we have to have experiential knowledge of evil. We have to understand the difference between good and evil. God's the sole source of anything that's good, and it has to be demonstrated to us that God is our one and only hope. God requires that we be faithful to him and him alone. There cannot and will not ever be another besides him. We have to experience evil so we can understand what God protects us from. See, the question is not, Lord, why did you allow this? The question is, thank you that this is what you protect me from. And God in his great and unlimited wisdom will not hold anything back. He will not hold anything back. And we look at the horrific evil. But he wants us, because he's offering us the choice to love him, he wants us to see this is what's out there. This is what happens even if I allow someone else to have intermediate power and control over you. It has to be me or nothing. So he's not going to hold anything back. So what do we see? We see 60 million lives snuffed out before they even get a chance to hit the air or the atmosphere. Yeah. And that's what we see. It's not only critical that we experience evil, God is not going to place limits on it. He will hold nothing back. And it's kind of interesting when you consider all this because the angels who are sitting in heaven who a third of them decided to rebel. Um, you may recall a show years ago when they were still Good Morning America. Dr. Tim Johnson was the medical guy on there. He's uh, also an ordained pastor. And he had written a book, and he said, they asked him, well, why are we here? And he said, I think we're a demonstration project for the angels. Because the angels... The only way they can experience is by watching what we go through. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to the angels as well as human beings. So I'm inclined to agree with them. Now, why did he do it this way? The notion that Jesus is coming for his bride gives us the clue. He forgives us of everything. And he did the work. He did the suffering. He went through the agony for us. And all we have to do is say, yes, I believe. The choice is so simple. And Jesus was willing to die for us in a horrific way. Now, if this is true, and we know we, lo we, we, we serve a sovereign God, and we readily admit God doesn't need us. He wants us. He wants us. Because he's perfect love, and he wants to love us far more extravagantly far more 
than we can imagine. You know, God's pure love, and he craves relationship with us. And he wants to lavish that relationship upon us to the absolute best that we can that's far above anything we could ask or imagine. So we're created in the natural to have experiential knowledge of evil so that we can express free will and choose to worship a loving God out of faith who took care of everything. Love demands that we choose. Love cannot be forced on us. That's not love. That's power and control. And that's what Satan wants. And at the end, regardless of what you do, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But it's not a command. It's not a command that you have to do this. It will be a joyful statement of the truth of a sovereign God who loves you far more than you could ask or imagine. And for those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will joyfully fall at his feet. And we will cry out and say, thank you. Thank you, and I'm ready to worship you forever. Choose God. Believe on his son's name. Pursue him on a daily basis. Be faithful. Romans 8, 17 through 20. Now if we're children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, then in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought it into freedom and glory of the children of God. Choose God. Pursue him on a daily basis and be faithful. Thank you, Reverend Marika. Amen. God is love. Amen. Amen. Give another hand. I praise the Lord for that message this morning. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, at this time, I ask uh, Reverend Nikki Bland to come and share a song at this time. Yeah. It was cold this morning. I started to put on a turtleneck. <laughs> I'm from South Carolina. I like to froze to death this morning. <laughs> I'm not whining or nothing, but... And I know Candy's happy, but I was cold. Help me on over here, please. This song, thank you. This song is about prayer. Uh, Glenn, I think you'll, you know, just listen to this, this song. Uh, you know, when we lay our life out before the Lord, he knows, right? He, he knows. Wait a minute. Let me stop right here just a moment and say this. If you're new to this assembly and you're experiencing a sweet spirit, it is nothing that any person in here can convey. It is the Holy Spirit of the living God. Amen. For where two or three are gathered together in the name of the blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, Jesus said he's in the midst. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> now this, no, no, not yet. Let me finish talking. Oh, my, he's trying to shut me off here. Lord, have mercy. And she said, I asked my wife, I have a motor mouth. I'm guilty. Have a motor mouth, she knows. Um, let me set the stage for this song. Just to <laughs> anyway, this song is about prayer. When I first heard it, I fell in love with it. It sounded a little cocky to me, all right? But it's about knowing that your prayer is heard up yonder, amen? Before the throne of glory, it's about knowing that your prayer is received. Okay, go ahead. 
Yes. <laughs> I won't worry for it's clear My answer is so near I went back to the place where grace abounds He's been so faithful and so true Always there to see me through and I know heaven's already been notified. I have touched his throne before. My prayers have knocked on heaven's door. My faith has never, it's never been denied. So I'll lay down my head tonight And I know everything's gonna be all right Because heaven's already been notified You got burdens hard to bear So I've kept you in my prayers I've been calling for your needs to be supplied And to fix what troubles you That's just what God, He loves to do And I know heaven's already been notified His throne before my prayers have not on heaven's door. My faith has never, it's never been denied. Oh, no. So I'll lay down my head tonight, and I know everything's gonna be all right because heaven. Already been notified. I have touched his throne before. My prayers have not on heaven's door. My faith has never, it's never been denied. Oh no. So I'll lay down. I hear tonight, and I know everything's gonna be all right because heaven's already been notified. You don't have to cry those same old tears, for I just whisper in his ear. God in heaven, it's already been. God in heaven, it's already been notified. Pray on, pray on, pray on. We're here to remember 
Ronald Wayne Hamner, a veteran, a father, a deacon, and a good friend to a lot of us in here. He really did love this church. He loved each and every one of y'all. He spent several years in the Army. I'm not sure, but I think at the point of his discharge, he was what, uh, what uh, E4, which most of us that's in the military knows that as a spec four or a specialist four. He has been my friend since 99. And he's been the all's friend for I don't know how long. But through him, we've had some good times. I did. Um, me and Kenny both would pick on him about a lady they used to work with. And we said, oh, well, we're going to go get Miss Bessie for you, Ron. And he looked at you, oh, shut up, Roger. <laughs> Ain't no Miss Bessie. But we had fun picking on him. He enjoyed it, too. I, he'll act like he was mad, but he enjoyed it, too. So at this time, I would like Brother Lenny and Brother Jordan to come down here as we fold up the flag for Brother Ron. so much. This time I'll have uh, Brother Mickey Blanton come and share the song. I want to introduce uh, this song with uh, scripture. found in uh, 
First Peter, I believe. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, but received the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. This song is about redemption.
He loved praising the Lord. He was also a private man, but he loved praising the Lord. So that was all that mattered to him. Uh, he was a father, a veteran, a deacon, a friend. And I uh, just wanted to share a little bit. And also, any of those family and friends, those that are here with us today, uh, we have a microphone up front. We'd like you to share anything that's on your heart about Ron or a memory, anything. Right that we ask you to please come at this time. And uh, but he was born December 13th, 1949, and he passed on June 25th, 2018, at the Salem Veterans Medical Center there in Salem, Virginia, at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Brother Ron, was, he was in the service in 1976. He was with the uh, U.S. United States Army. Uh, he worked at News in Advance in Lynchburg and Mail America in Forest, Virginia for several years. Some other different jobs I understand as well. Uh, his strong faith and his love for life were an inspiration to all who knew him. Although his illness presented many obstacles in his life, Ron's enthusiasm never faltered. Amen. And I just love it. I just hear his voice echoing Praise the Lord. He loved to come to church. He just did, did just really upset if he couldn't be here. Wow. Praise God for that. Um, he leaves his sister Barbara Hammer, who's with us today. And he loved Barbara. He loved you very much. Yes, he did. Amen. <laughs> he had a brother and a daughter named Marianne. I mean, please forgive if I don't pronounce these names correctly. But Tocca, P A T O C K A, and Sparks Revive. And I had the privilege of speaking with her on the phone, a lovely young woman, and uh, just uh, we're going to give this service uh, video to her. But we're thankful for her and that God gave us Ron, you know, and we appreciate that. And um, he has some friends and caregivers, and they're with us today. I appreciate them helping and all the different deacons and different ones that helped Ron through time. Uh, Tyree and Sister Valtel Colt, caregivers, and Willander. I'm sorry if I can't pronounce it right. So strong, thank you, and Roma Fuqua. So thank you for being here with us, and we pray God for you. <laughs> we have Pam and Dennis Hayes, and they took care of him as well, picking up, and uh, Brother Lawrence, Randall and Cheryl Randall, Candlelight Ministries, and there's some other services that's happening, Brother Ron and some of our other veterans as well, but we'll let you know when those are. But we appreciate uh, Brother Ron and... Um, He's in heaven today. That says he's home. He's already there. Amen. He can walk. He can move. He's praising the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So anyone have the words of family and friends, please come on up at this time. Brother Roger. I was just informed that he was also a grandfather and a great-grandfather. But right now, he's up there with Dad, yes. Clifton Bowley, yes. Kathy, and all of them having a good time. I think now, the way Ron loved the Lord and all like that, he's probably with Dad and Clifton trying to get Satan out of there and just, and just convert everybody that's in hell. Amen. Because Amen. Ron did love the Lord, yes. and he had no shame of speaking it out in public. We all should be like that. We all should not be ashamed to bow our heads and pray in public, to speak about God in public, or even when you hear somebody use God's name in vain, to go up to them and correct them. Because that is a sin, and we need to let them know that. And Ron had no qualms of doing any of that. He... Matter of fact, the times he'd come over to our mom and dad's house for when we had the barbecue, we'd all get everything set up on the table and sit down. He said, well, are we going to pray? Mm -hmm. Amen. And after we, pray, we prayed, he said, all right, now let's eat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm going to miss Ron. I'm going to miss picking on him. Mom says she's going to miss me picking on him, too, and like I said, we used to pick on him about Miss Bessie and all like that. And he, he used to enjoy it, even though he acted like he didn't, but he didn't. But if I didn't do it, he'd come up to me and said, Roger, are you okay? I said, yeah, why? He said, you ain't picked on me yet. So 
He knew if I didn't pick on him, there was something on my mind or I wasn't feeling good. Ron, we're going to miss you, buddy. He always liked to eat good, and I appreciate that of him, and because uh, I do too. But uh, he's just a blessing. He'd always come up, and he said, "Can you sing this song? Can you get Torrance to sing this song?" And I go, "Yeah, we can do that." So he always loved God's music, and I appreciate that of him. Mm -hmm. What I remember most about Ron, same thing as y'all are saying, is how exuberant he was about praising the Lord. It just came out. No restraints, no filters. As, as Roger said, he didn't care what anybody thought about him. And you, you, mimic, you mimicked him really well. I can't do it, but he said, praise the Lord. And, and, and when they put the song, you remember, Barbara, and uh, his sister, and when the, his favorite songs would come on, he'd say, hallelujah. And you could hear it all over the church, and it was so powerful. His love and passion for the Lord just shone out. And I just praise God for him and his life. And I remember Pastor Dave one time shared with, well, he shared it several times, how much he loved roller coasters. And as much as Jeff and I love um, Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, uh, I decided one day just to ask him. And his eyes just lit up. And he began to talk about all the rides he'd been on. And he was just like a little kid sometimes, just like a child. And that's what the Bible says, you know. His children are, are like children, like children like a child, and um, he loved his sister Barbara so much. Um, many, many times he would ask us to pray for you, Barbara. He loved you. And um, our condolences, and we praise God. We know one day we're going to see him in heaven, and he'll probably be one of the ones that is shouting the loudest. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> well, good afternoon. This is my first time. Bear with me. Y'all know him as Deacon Ron. I called him the hammer. I met him at News in Advance. He touched my heart. He became yeah. part of my family. I tried to take him the best I could. But he, I know he loved this church. Before I started working, I would bring him every Sunday. I never came in. Now I see why he loved coming to this church. Pastor Cash, Miss Cash, and, and the rest of y'all here, I feel comfortable sitting over there. Amen. Ron is a very good man. He didn't suffer. I won't let y'all know he didn't suffer at all. Matter of fact, a nurse told me that he was there with him to the last, that he wasn't alone. It's hard for me, because I had to talk to him every day, three or four times a day. I still wait. Yeah. And life will be cold. I know you want me to stand up and say something, so I thank y'all for coming to celebrate his going home. I'm going to miss him. I'm going to have to try to come back to this church here, because I kind of like it. <laughs> Washington, D.C., and I've been to a couple of churches. I'm going to be honest. This feeling I have now, I have not felt at another church. Yeah. 
If y'all had me, I'd try to come here Sunday. You're welcome. <laughs> Doing this for God and the hammer. thank everyone for coming here today. I just want to say one of the things about Mr. Hammer. Well, it's two of the things. <laughs> One, I miss you, Ron. Two, Mr. Ron loved to eat. <laughs> he loved to eat, okay? And he would take stuff, and I turned my head. He got this over here like this. I said, Mr. Hammer, what do you have over there? He said, um, so I go over there and look. I said, now, you know you can't have that. He said, please, please. He kept pleading. I said, OK, this time, you can have that. But Mr. Mr. Hammer loved to eat, but he also loved the Lord. And I miss you, Ron. Everybody have a nice day. Bye. I don't know if any of y'all know how silly Mr. Mr. Ron was. But we would pick him up for church and he sometimes going down the road, he'd be sitting back there singing. Just singing, he can't wait to get to church. He loved all of y'all so much. And we loved him, and, and silly he was. And what she said about him loving to eat, he did. Now we come pick him up for church and take him home, and, and he said, I'm hungry. He said, well, I said, well, Ron, have you eaten today? He said, they don't give me nothing out there. <laughs> hey, Hey, I said, well, did you have dinner? He said, I did, but it's gone. <laughs> so we'd stop and we'd get him a hamburger. And he'd be so hungry, we'd have to remind him to stop and pray. But he did. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. And he put it down, you know. But, but we loved him. He, um, he really lifted our spirits, his love for the Lord and his enthusiasm. Um, I miss him. I miss him a lot. probably a year or two. And then we talked to Veltese one day, found out we shouldn't have been doing that at all. Listen, everything he was getting wasn't on his diet. <laughs> he, he said, I, we I'm, I'm, putting on, I'm putting on weight. And I said, well, no kidding. <laughs> but I, I'm glad to have really had the opportunity to get to know him because he was a wonderful, funny, silly person. <laughs> and he loved the Lord. Uh, Judy and I and Matt had run out to our uh, house uh, one time for, I think it was Thanksgiving dinner or was it Christmas, Matt? Thanksgiving, yeah. And I told him, I said, uh, let me tell you this. He's, I said, uh, there was a, a, a chicken, a hen, and uh, a, uh, a hog walking down the street. And they happened to go by a uh, Salvation Army place where you make donations. And uh, the... Uh, you remember this one, don't you, Barbara? <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah. And uh -huh. uh, the uh, chicken said to the hog, let's go in here and make a donation. And the hog said to the chicken, that's easy for you to say. When you make a donation, it's just an egg or two. But when I make a donation, it's a whole ham. And he just really, I mean, he, he lost it, man. He was laughing so loud. <laughs> but I enjoyed Ron. 
because uh, Rod was the kind of fella that you just warm up to immediately. You know, if you like good people, you like Rod. So God bless you. Well, I just want to just thank the Lord for his many blessings, and I've always loved my brother a whole lot. He meant a lot to me and everything, and I would used to call him every night when I lived in English Meadows in Bedford and all, and every, when I talked to him on the phone, I said, hi, Ron, how you doing? Uh, I love you very much, and he would say, Barbara, I love you too, and I said, uh, hopefully, I said, when we get to heaven, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see Jesus' face and we'll, we'll be rejoicing and everything. And I tell you, I really, and I, I remember when he used to drive a car and everything, he used to take me to see the, um, uh, we used to go out and we go out to country cooking on Timberlake Road and everything like that. And, and I've always enjoyed the, the buffet, and I would love to eat, and I know Ron, my brother, he would love to eat too. And, and that's one of my favorite restaurants, is country cooking in Madison Heights, and then out on Timberlake Road too. But I'm just thankful and all that that. And, and I, I'm a member of, of Central Baptist Church, and my pastor, he picks me up every first and third Sunday of each month and everything. And I sing a solo in my church and, and I give out my testimony. So, but praise the Lord and all that, that I want to be cremated too, not put in the ground. I want to be cremated and, 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 go, and go to heaven and see the Lord's face. And, I, and I'm going to see. And I'll have, have a brand new body. No, I won't have any more suffering. No, it won't be no more aches or pains or anything like that. And so I just want to thank the Lord. But also, I want to give a, oh, uh, another testimony. Um, I had, had to go have a bite, had to go to the dermatologist here couple of uh, weeks back in June, June the 12th. And they did, they uh, looked at my leg and I had a place on my leg and they looked and said, well, they told me, said that they will probably have to do a biopsy to see if it was cancer or not. But uh, they don't, they, they, won, they did a biopsy here a couple of weeks ago up, up at the UVA and they said that um, they said they uh, haven't uh, got the uh, results back yet, but they won't know if it was cancer or not. But pray for me if after I have the surgery, I will be when they remove the cancer, I will be cancer free. Praise the Lord. Amen. bringing you here with us today. I have many special memories of Ron. I know every time I walked into the church, I mean, I can see many places where I remember Ron sitting all the time, but of late he would sit right back there in the back and Ron and I used to banter back and forth and I would flirt with Ron and his face would just turn red as a beat. I'd walk up to him and hug him and say, there's my handsome man. And he'd say, there's my Miss Debbie. And Yes, Ron definitely loved to eat. Miss Barbara and Ron came to my house for the uh, baptisms and the annual picnics we had at the house. And Ron and Barbara were sitting on the back porch and I got him a lap tray to sit there and there was a plate piled about this high and there was all kinds of desserts sitting around it. And I'm like, Ron, where are you gonna put all this? He said, that's just my first helping. I'm going back for seconds. So he had everybody getting him stuff, and he just kept thanking me, and Miss Barbara kept thanking me for being at my house and how beautiful the house was. But I'll miss hearing Ron sit back there in the back and yelling, praise the Lord, and thank you, Jesus. And 
he would get so emotional talking about God. And he would just start crying and crying. And every time I'd see him crying, I'd get to crying. So, but Ron just, he just oozed God's love. I mean, you could not be around that man that you did not feel the love of God. And if you didn't feel it, then you definitely had something wrong with you. I mean, he loved everybody with just such open enthusiasm and was such a giving and loving person. I'm gonna miss my hugs from him because he gave great big hugs. And I just love to hear him tell me how much he loved me all the time. And he loved to boost my ego and tell me how pretty I was all the time too. So I'm gonna miss that too. <laughs> so, but Ron, I know you're in heaven now and you're healthy and you're whole and you don't have all those health problems anymore. So and I know I'll get to see him again. And that's what I'm looking forward to more than anything else. So I miss you, my brother. in the Bush Gardens, one of our youth uh, church and school academy trips, and he had more fun than the kids. <laughs> he did. He was all over that park, and it was June, it was August 25th, and it was like 100 degrees that day, <laughs> and he had fun. We got him home because the heat was terrible, but he, he rode all them big, huge rides. I didn't think he'd like something like that. He shocked me, but he had a great time, and <laughs> we were we did, so us that went there, we have good memories of him having fun, just like a big kid. But, yeah, Brother Kenny. I knew Ron since 1992. The mm -hmm. first time I met him, he was at work, and he was outside smoking a cigarette. So I went out there and sat beside him, introduced him to me, I introduced him to me, and we became friends, and I told him point blank, if you want to be my friend again, put that cigarette out. Mm -hmm. So what he did, he threw it down and he put it out. He never smoked since then. Wow. Yeah. He had his ups and he had his downs. The ups were, I pick him up, go to Roanoke, mm -hmm. go to Happy's. Yeah. And he was happy about that. And we went to Bedford uh, restaurant mm -hmm. and I had a mustard package and I was squeezing it. He dared me to squeeze it I said, don't do Jeremy to squeeze it. So he, I squeezed it. Must have worn all the way across his shirt. He did not get mad or nothing. He just laughed about it, and we went on to Roanoke. His downs were, he called me one night, one afternoon, and he had a Chevrolet Sprint three-cylinder. He said, somebody hit my car. Seconds after he got out of the car, went inside the door, and he's closing it, and somebody hit him from behind. Mm. It went up about six foot up in the air, mm. telephone pole. He had his trunk, real small trunk, was in his back seat, and his rim was bent, and the guy who hit him was a drunk. And it was a Camaro, a 4,000 pound car, hit a 1,000 pound other car. And it kept on going. Sooner or later, car came back on a uh, tow truck. He got picked up for it. So, Ron was a good man. I loved him. Then last month, I went to, with Roger to VA, and I knew he was up there, so somebody told me. So me and him, Roger went up there to see him, and he said, me and him was the only ones up there. Nobody else came to see him. So the second time we went up there, I saw him, he was playing cards bingo. 52 dock, uh, deck of cards. I stayed for a few minutes, he was busy, so I left. Third time we went up there, I went to his room, he wasn't there. Fourth time I we went up there, he wasn't there. Come find out, 
Monday, he died. So I bless God, bless Ron, where he's at now. He's in a better place. Thank you. When I think of Ron, I always think of the following verses in the Bible that best describe him. And it's found in Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. It said they, they brought young children to Jesus, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And he said unto them, Allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Truly I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he will not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Ron was a simple man, not simple-minded, a simple man. There was nothing complicated about Ron at all. He had the heart of a child. That's the big thing that gave him the faith that he had and the strength that he had was he had the heart of a child. He had the heart of a child in a number of ways. One, he believed the word of God with their question. Every little child believes everything that they read in here. It's we adults that always try to question what we see. Ron had no problem with believing the word of God. He believed in the power of prayer without question. When he asked you to pray for him, he expected God to move every time. And he prayed for us as well. Believed in the power of prayer without question as a child would. And that's what you've got to do if you are going to enter into the kingdom of God. He wanted more than anything else to serve God. He was one of the most serious people that I ever met about being a deacon. When the opportunity to become a deacon was given in the church here, he was the first one in line to get an application. And he told me, he said, Brother Dave, he said, I sat up half the night filling this thing out to make sure it was right because I really want to be a deacon. When do you ever hear something like that? Isn't that that's, that's great. That's great. And that's the heart of a child. And, and in his health condition, about the only thing that he was able to do was to give out bulletins and take up the offering. A lot of times Glenn would share with me how if he was here, he'd tell Glenn, now you make sure I get to get up there. And I've seen him get up out of a wheelchair and come down here to take up the offering, and he braced himself against that altar. A lot of y'all didn't know that because he hardly could walk. But he was faithful about taking up that offering. And he did it with, with, with seriousness and determination that was really second to no one. And you know, it's not what you do that counts with the Lord. People think that all those that are behind the pulpit Oh, they're going to get the biggest pat on the back of all. That's not true. Don't y'all remember hearing a birthday time in heaven when Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell were sitting in the waiting room to get into heaven, and there come a little old truck driver from J.B. Hunt in there and sat down with them. And it won't but just a few minutes that Peter came and said, Brother, you come on in here. And he welcomed that little old truck driver in, in there. And hours later, nobody come to get them yet. And so finally, Peter come to the thing, and Jerry Falwell got up and said, Don't you know who we are? Peter said, Yes, I do. But that little truck driver scared the devil out of more people than both of y'all put together. <laughs> it's not what you do. It's, it's, it's how you do it. And, what, and I said all of that to say this. The first thing that Ron heard when he got to heaven, no doubt, was well done. Well done. Because he was faithful with the two tasks that he had. 
I love this part. He was always in full agreement with the vision that the Lord gave me for the church. I could present any plan, and he'd go, you know what, Brother Dave, I like that. Let's do that. Man, that's the kind, you know, one of us could lie and the other would swear to it, you know? I like that. I like, uh, he, was a, he was a true deacon, man. He had my back. That's the real thing right there. And not only was he that way, he was on board with, with what we were trying to do. He was tenderhearted. And he had compassion for people. He loved people. He loved our singers. He was y'all's biggest fan. All y'all that sing, man, you couldn't get a better fan than Ron Hamner. He would shout and cry when he heard his favorite songs, and we're going to close out in just a minute or two with one of those. It, it, was, it was great just watching Ron praise the Lord. He loved the preaching of the Word. And you know, a lot of times he was really shocked to hear about the evil that's going on in the world because Ron had the heart of a child and he could not understand how people could do wicked things like they did. Now, another thing about Ron was he was fun-loving as well. Now, to look at Ron, he looked like just a plain old man or whatever, you know, that just kind of cruised through. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. Take him to an amusement park. He went on every church trip that we went on. And I've got a picture of him on one of them roller coasters that we were at King's Dominion one time that shoots you out through a tube. And he was sitting behind Kit beside Kenny Ingalls. And they cut that photograph right at the moment when Kenny had the look of horror on his face. And I would have too. And Ron was just like this. And they were, I mean, boom, they were going up. It didn't faze him. He'd get on the worst, awful rides, and he thought it was fun. Did not, he was not afraid of anything. And Donna was mentioning this day that we were at Bush Gardens. It wasn't 100, honey. It was 105. We thought we were going to lose him. He had gone all through the park, was getting on rides, but that heat started to get to him to the point that he would go up to each of us and he went, my name is Ron, and I think I'm riding home with candy and shame. After the fourth time he said that, I said, we're going to lose Ron. We need to get him some water, get him cool. And Big Ed Whitley picked Ron up and carried him out the park. Once he got the wind blowing on him, he was back to being Ron again. Didn't bother him at all, though. That's, that was even tough. When it came to those dinners that we used to have over at the school, I'm going to confess something to y'all. I've been serving y'all what I call roast beef for years, but if you'd have listened to me closely, you would have heard me say roast beast. <laughs> it was deer meat. It was venison. Ron knew that, and he loved it. The rest of y'all would go, yeah, that's not deer meat, is it? I, I can't eat deer meat, and I'd go, it's roast beast. And y'all would say, that's the best stuff I've ate in my life. Ron knew it, and he still liked it. Ron, he had a lot of health problems. And bless him, he, his heart started giving out in the last days. And he, he, had, he, he, he started having trouble walking. Then he was no longer able to do that or, or, or to even take care of himself. And so, as a result, he was hospitalized in, in, in the nursing facilities and so forth, and the last time that we saw him was just a day or two before he died, and his lungs had stopped working, and he was on life support, and Don and I knew at that time that he was going to be going home real, real soon. And so, as of now, Ron is in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. And... He does, he's not hooked up to IVs or a respirator. He's breathing the clean air of the streets of gold up there right now. And, and he is there for one reason. And one reason only. He believed the word of God and he trusted Christ as his Savior. And Jesus had a little bit to say about that. And this is what I'm going to close with. 
We read it at funerals, but it ought to be read to the living as well. Jesus made this statement, and Ron heard it, and you need to hear it this morning. In John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. A lot of us are coming in here this morning with a lot of stuff on our minds, a lot of trouble in this world, but Jesus said, you don't have to be troubled. Your heart don't have to be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe in me also. If you believe in God the Father, you should believe in God the Son as well. And don't let it bother you. Don't let things worry you. God's got all of this. He, uh, he, he says in the next verse, and I love the King James on this one, and I'll ride this to the ground. In my father's house are many mansions. I was at a funeral yesterday, and the preacher said, In my father's house are many rooms. And I wanted to holler, When I die, I'm not going to the Motel 6. I'm sorry. God is not going to leave the light on for me up there. The King James says mansions, and that's what it is. Yes. If anyone understands an ancient Hebrew wedding, the son would go to his father's house, which was massive, and he would build this massive wing onto his father's house that literally was a mansion, and it was huge, and it wasn't a room. Oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven to get me a room. Come on now. <laughs> Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. Do you think he's been working on a room for 2,000 years? Ron has a mansion this morning. Not a room. Not a room. And he said, if it weren't so, I would have told you. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And listen to this carefully, just for everybody in here. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also there. Are two times that he's going to do that. He's either coming for you individually or he's coming for the whole church at one time. But you are going to get out of here one way or the other if you are saved. He will come to get you. He may get some of us early as he's already done. And once his, your place is ready, he's coming to get you. you got to be ready. Else he will come for the entire church in the rapture one day soon. And he said, I want you to be with me. And then he made the statement to his disciples, and where I go you know, and the way you know. And there was always one in the group that didn't understand, had a hard head, and had to be convinced, and that was Thomas. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? And he told it to Thomas one last time, but when Ron heard it, he got it the first time. Jesus made this statement. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to make it into the kingdom of heaven, if you want to make it into the presence of the Lord, there ain't but one way you can go. I don't care what other preachers say. I don't care what people on TV that tell you, oh, there are many paths to the Lord. No, there are many paths to hell. Right. And any path that ain't to the Lord is a path to hell. Jesus said no one gets to the Father, no one comes to the Father but through me. And so this morning as I close, if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, you've got to do it by accepting Jesus. You've got to follow Jesus. He's got to be your Savior. Any other way, Jesus said, is the way of a thief and a robber and they will not get in. There is no other way, and Ron knew that. And he chose that way, and he followed that way, and that's where he's at right now. Shall we bow our heads for the invitation? <coughs> Folks, you've heard a lot of wonderful things said this morning, and it is all because...